All right, let's talk about chapter 17, which is on marine resources. And so uh, basically we're going to be talking about um, things that you can get in the ocean uh, in terms of food or minerals or just everyday objects. All right, so some resources that you can find in the ocean um, are seaweeds, jellyfish, cucumbers, sea cucumbers, polychaete, worms, fish, mollusks, crustaceans. So all of these things are eaten at some place around the world, right? Typically here in Hawaii, you probably would not eat a sea cucumber or a polychaete worm um, or jellyfish for that matter, but uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, they will eat jellyfish and sea cucumbers. Um, and polychaete worms are eaten um, mainly in Pacific Islands. Uh, but essentially re resources from the ocean uh, em employ and feed millions of people around the world. So uh, it, in terms of getting the amount of food and getting a job, uh, there's no better place in, than to go out into the ocean to get it, really. Uh, the amount of food consumed... Um, by the human population represents about 1%. That's because not everywhere uh, on earth, uh, not all populations eat uh, seafood or uh, they're in an area where seafood is hard to obtain. Uh, so definitely before the early 1900s, um, places that were landlocked or in the middle of a continent, like uh, let's just say Kansas, for example, um, those people did not get seafood on a regular basis, if at all. Um, and that's because typically the seafood would go bad before it got there. They didn't have uh, rapid transport to get the food into the middle of the country. And so uh, if they got seafood into, uh, let's just say Kansas, it would be heavily salted and uh, probably processed to some degree. But once uh, modern day processing of seafood um, and uh, refrigeration, so storage on ice. Once that became a thing, then you started seeing uh, seafood transported uh, to all places around the earth. Um, the demand for seafood is very high, and because of that, uh, the amount of wild uh, uh, fisheries uh, cannot usually sustain the demand and so in that sense those fisheries are being overfished or overexploited uh, depending on which one and those are shrimp mollusks fish and crustaceans so pretty much majority of the uh, seafood resources that we get from the ocean are overcaught and overfished and need to be supplemented with uh, farm farm raised uh, organisms so in that sense, all of your shrimp that you guys get in the store, that's all farm-raised shrimp. You're not getting wild-caught shrimp anymore. Uh, it would be really expensive to catch wild-caught shrimp at this point. Um, there's a ton of species of fish that are farm-raised. So your salmon and your tilapia, all of those are farm-raised uh, because you typically don't find them in... Um, you. You can't get wild-caught salmon. Well, I mean, you can get wild-caught salmon, but it's more expensive. And uh, it's in less abundance. And then those fishing pressures have increased um, on those on these particular um, uh, fisheries because of, of affluent countries. So, yes, the United States is uh, one of the culprits. And... Um, we require a huge amount of seafood and because of that the the amount of fish that's caught uh, has increased over time so fishing technologies have also um, uh, become more advanced so as you can see here uh, these are just two examples of modern fishing boats that allow for processing of the fish on board. So no longer do you put the fish on ice, bring it back to shore, and then somebody else processes it. 
Um, there's a lot of fisheries out there where the processing of the fish happens right then and there so you can get the freshest um, fillet of fish uh, that you can get. Uh, these processing plants can do all of the things listed right there. They can fillet fresh, fresh fish, they can freeze the fish, they can can it, they can dry it and salt it, they can smoke it, they can marinate it, they can make fish sticks, or they can even make fish meal out of the parts that they don't typically use to make food out of. So as you can see, they have whole conveyor belts. They have people cutting up the fish as it goes along. Um, and then uh, you see the fillets in that right hand image there working down the, the conveyor belt um, into, I, I, I don't know, I guess it's going to be frozen or fried or of some sort. Um, but yeah, uh, these are pretty large ships. All right, so here's a graphic of just how much fish is consumed uh, per person per year in kilograms. And so the darker blue color that you see along the coastlines, the more uh, fish is that is typically eaten by that um by that country or those people. So you can see in Asia, they eat about 144 kilograms per person per year of seafood, right? So that's quite a bit. Um, and let's compare it to, um, uh, what is, where is that at? Central America over kind of by Costa Rica and Panama. It looks like they don't eat that much seafood at all, probably anywhere between zero and 30 uh, kilograms per person per day or per year um, so it it really ranges but then you have some places like Hawaii here in Hawaii we probably eat anywhere from 50 to 70 um, kilograms uh, per person per year of seafood so you can just see uh, some of the statistics right there but seafood is very imp is a very important diet for majority of the world's populations. All right, so this graph here shows weak fish. So it's a type of fish that, um, and it shows you the commercial landing. So how much fish is brought in commercially and how much fish is brought in recreationally. So you have uh, commercial fishermen going out and getting it and that's their business, that's what they do. And then you have recreational people going out and just, oh, I want to catch some fish for fun, All right? Um, so that's the difference between those two. And you can see this graph between 1982 and 2014. And you can see in the millions of pounds, the difference between um, commercial and recreational landings, as well as over time, the decrease in the amount of fish caught. So you can see back in the 80s, there was anywhere from, let's just say, 17 to 20 million pounds of this fish caught every year, right? And it would fluctuate depending on what was going on. But then you notice in the 1990s, there seemed to be a drastic drop in the amount of fish available, okay? And you can see it slowly started declining little by little until you got to the 2000s and it finally got down to about 7 million pounds of fish caught every year until you got to about, oh, let's just say 2005 where it decreased below 5 and it's probably like, what, 3 to 4 million pounds of fish caught till you get to 2014 where it's barely above zero so it's probably in the thousands now probably not millions right so you can just see how drastic uh, overfishing um, has has caused this fishery to decrease uh, exponentially right so not only do you have the commercial uh, fishing pressures which demands quite a lot of fish but you also have recreational people going out there um, and adding pressure to the fisheries and this is, this is an example of weak fish, um, but there's examples of that uh, throughout all of the fisheries around the world. And the major fishing areas uh, around the world uh, occur within coastal waters. So 95% of the fisheries 
is within coastal waters. Um, the other 5% are in the deep ocean. That's like your tunas and your marlins. Those typically will uh, live out in the deep ocean, or not deep ocean, but uh, out in the open ocean. But majority of the organisms that are caught and eaten are near coastal regions. And over 50% of those catches are taken within 7% of the ocean surface. So uh, you definitely don't have to go very deep in order to catch uh, these organisms because majority of them live at the surface. And because of high primary production near the continental shelf, that's the reason why uh, you catch so much fish in the coastal regions. Right? So that map right there on the bottom just shows you the jurisdiction um, not jurisdiction, I should say, the uh, fishing zones uh, broken up around the world. And if you are registered in a particular fishing zone, so you can see Hawaii is within zone 77, which is East Central Pacific. If you registered in Hawaii, you can only fish within that zone. You can't go, let's just say somebody registered in 77, which is Hawaii, but they want to go to 81 because they know that there's some tuna down there. Well, they can't go fish down there because they don't have the jurisdiction to. All right, All right so some major fishing, fishing techniques. Um, the first one is uh, uh, what, what we'll call purse seines. Um, and these, this technique is mainly used to catch clupioid fishes that eat plankton near the surface at upwelling areas. So clupioid fishes are typically like your sardines or your, um, uh, I forget what the other one is, but they, they're very small fishes, all right? These are primary consumers because they feed on plankton, okay? And... Typically, this type of fish will either be fresh, so a lot of people eat sardines fresh, or they can them, or they pickle them, or make fish oil, fish flour, or fish meal. So those are the primary uses for this type of fish. And let's look at how a persane works, all right? Persane sounds just like what it sounds. It, it looks like a purse in the end, because what it does is it wraps around a group of fishes, and you can see in that first image on the top uh, left-hand corner there, they're laying out the net, and they're trying not to scare the fish. And then eventually, in the top right-hand corner there, they'll bring the net around and connect it to the main boat. And then they will pull that bottom line to close the gap in the bottom so the fish can't escape through the bottom. And then in the bottom left-hand image there, you can see they've closed up the, the hole in the bottom. So now it's just a floating net, uh, floating net that looks like a giant purse, right? And so now they will pull in that top line and they will start to cause the fish to come closer and closer to the boat and aggregate closer so that once you get to the image on the bottom right-hand corner there, um, the fish are aggregated, they're close to the boat, and all you have to do is lift the net into the boat, and you've got a bunch of fish. So that is a purse scene. Okay, this typically only works for schooling fishes that tend to group together. If you were to try to do this with tuna, they would just escape. All right, next you have trawls. So in this uh, particular method, they typically will use this to catch cod, uh, pollock, haddock, Hake and whiting. Um, these types of fish uh, tend to school, but they tend to be in a, a little bit deeper water, so they're not usually at the surface. Um, Pollock is probably the largest fishery in the U.S. Um, it's also probably uh, the reason why stellar sea lions, sea lion populations have declined, is because Pollock was their main uh, food source. And the U.S. Uh, pretty much uses Pollock for just about everything. So if you guys have ever gone to McDonald's and eaten a, a filet of fish burger from there, you are eating Pollock, all right? Uh, pretty much any processed uh, white meat fish. So when you go, and go to the store and you get those uh, fish sticks, right, uh, or the, the breaded, uh, breaded fish, 
uh, typically those will be pollock um, as well too. Um, but this fishery is overfished uh, in most of the fisheries, except for pollock, I believe. I think pollock is the only one that is um, sustainable at the moment. Um, but as you can see here, uh, trawls, uh, you just have these giant nets that are attached to the boat on either side. It's either dragged behind the boat or it's attached on the side. And as the boat is uh, moving along, it scoops up whatever fish um, it can catch. So it gets to a point where the fish get trapped in the net and they get trapped in the back of the net so that they can't uh, swim out of it and then are collected um, once the nets are pulled on board. All right, so here's a here's an image of what a trawl looks like. So you can see there's these otter boards. Those otter boards are meant to stabilize the net so it doesn't spin around and tie itself in a knot. Uh, you have uh, warp wires, and those are ones that are meant to be attached to the boat and be and pull the net. You've got weights that will weigh down the net so it doesn't float up to the surface. Um, and then you have what's known as a cod end, and that's where the fish are collected at. Okay, so now you can have, this is a midwater trawl. Um, you can have surface trawls, midwater trawls, and bottom trawls. Bottom trawls are, I believe, illegal because they do a lot of damage to the uh, ocean floor. Uh, so you can imagine uh, a lot of coral and a lot of marine organisms get caught up in bottom trawls. Uh, third, you have long lines, and these are typically what's used to catch your migratory uh, fish species like your tunas, your marlins, and your uh, swordfish, and your mahi-mahis and whatnot. Um, these are typically uh, put out in the open ocean, and they, this long line basically is, is what it suggests. It's a really long line with a bunch of hooks, and on, on each hook, there's a bait. All right. And then every so often you have a float um, and these these long lines are put just below the surface and it's usually attached to some sort of uh, radio beacon or buoy of some sort so that the the boat who put it out there can go back and find it all right? and, and reel in all the fish that it caught. And then lastly you have gill nets. I believe gill nets are illegal as well too. Um, because of just how devastating they are. Uh, gill nets uh, are essentially just nets that are left out and floated at the surface, but they're not like the purse saying they don't enclose their fish. They just kind of act as a horizontal barrier, right? And what happens is the, the fish will get uh, hit the net. It will start to wiggle as you can see in the image here. And eventually, it, because it's trying to wiggle itself forward, its gills will get caught in the net and it cannot reverse itself back out because the net is now entangled in its gills and it will eventually die. Um, this is a highly regulated fishery and I think in most places it is banned just because of how um, seems like it's pretty cruel and this particular type of uh, met fishing method is non-selective which means it will catch just anything it'll catch a turtle it'll catch a dolphin uh, this is primarily what uh, ghost ghost fishing uh, is from but we'll talk about ghost fishing in a little bit all right so what's the difference between optimal yield or what is optimal yield I should say um, it's the difference between renewable and non-renewable -re sources, okay? So when I say uh, uh, that a fishery is sustainable, that means it's renewable because it can uh, reproduce and replenish its stocks, whereas a non-renewable resource is much like oil, all right, if you, if you want to think about it. Oil is not renewable because there isn't a continuing supply of oil. There's just a finite amount. And once we go through all of that supply, that's it. There's no more, right? Uh, and so there are a lot of fisheries that are like that. For instance, 
uh, your, there's a, a fish called orange ruffy, and we don't have that here in Hawaii. But um, I know in the Atlantic, this uh, is a highly prized fish, and it is said to be very good, um, but it is overfished. Right. And so it's gotten to the point where orange ruffy species cannot reproduce fast enough to replenish their stocks in order to meet with uh, the fishing demand. OK, so this usually happens when fishing exceeds reproductive abilities um, of a fish species and then fish overfishing will occur. So let's look at this graph here. Um, this is a graph of sustainable catch uh, on the y-axis and fishing effort on the x-axis. And so anything in that blue area, which is underutilized, um, that means that you leave just enough fish in the wild to be able to reproduce to keep the, the, uh, the stock um, plentiful. So you, you take... Uh, you don't take as much as you need. You take less than what you need is what's happening in that situation. And there are uh, a few fisheries that are in this category right here, but not too many of them. The pink area is known as your optimal yield. And so in this area, you have at the very top of the curve your maximum sustainable yield. And that top of the curve is basically where every fishing company tries to get at with their fishery because that means that that fishing company is catching just the right amount of fish in order uh, to be sustainable but they're not and they're putting just the right amount of fishing effort so in the underutilized section there they are not catching as much fish and they're not uh, wasting too much effort catching that fish. So they, um, they're, how do you say, they're being more efficient. But uh, when you get to your maximum sustainable yield, you are at like the sweet spot where you're catching as much fish as you possibly can with the least amount of effort with, with not damaging uh, the fishery as much. So you're still, the fishery is still able to reproduce enough to replenish its stocks. And the fishing effort is low enough that you're not spending too much time and effort looking for these fish, all right? So if, if that makes sense to you guys. And then overfishing is when you get to a point where you're spending too much time looking for the fish and um, trying to fish out as much fish as you can, but you don't get a lot of fish because there's really nothing there. You are basically catching almost everything that you can possibly catch, uh, which means you're not leaving any fish behind to replenish the stocks. So in this case, you are taking more than you should. Okay. All right, so 52% uh, of the fisheries uh, around the world is fully exploited, which means they are to the point where they are um, uh, almost overfished, but um, are pretty heavily fished. 17% um, of them are overexploited. So that means they are being overfished and the, the population cannot sustain itself anymore. 7% of them are depleted. Um, so those examples right there, cod, herring, halibut, salmon, Alaskan king crab, to name a few, um, those cannot reproduce enough to replenish the stocks. They are to the point where if you fish, oh, if you fish them anymore, they will probably disappear at some point in time. Um, and then only 3% of the fisheries are underexploited. So typically those are like your krill and your jellyfish and your sea cucumbers. Um, those ones, not the good tasting ones, um, are underexploited.
Okay, so what are the environmental impacts of overfishing? And as you can see in the uh, uh, cartoon that I have here, um, the fish are talking to each other and they're saying, at least we don't have to worry about old age. Well, yeah, but let's, let's talk about this because technically spe speaking, when, um, when you go out to go fishing, uh, typically there will be uh, open times in which uh, you can go fishing for certain species and there'll be other times like open season and there'll be other times where you can't catch them but when it is open season they tell you okay you have to catch a certain size individual and that's usually the larger individuals all right because the larger individuals that are caught have more meat on them so you can sell them for higher prices um, and you can and you can get more of the resource right whereas the smaller individuals are typically left behind but what i'm going to tell you is that should be the other way around we should actually be calling uh, catching more of the smaller individuals and leaving behind more of the larger individuals because the smaller females do not produce as many eggs or offspring viable offspring as the larger counterparts do and those larvae from the smaller uh, females, they grow much slower. Um, so in a sense, what we are doing right now is handicapping those um, fisheries. So we are selecting to take out those larger individuals um, and we are leaving behind the smaller ones. And so in a sense, we are leaving behind the weakest individuals, whereas in nature, nature typically takes out the weaker individuals and leaves behind the stronger ones, right? Okay, so then what are some issues with commercial fishing? Uh, commercial fisheries, um, and these are the two main problems, bycatch and ghost fishing. Bycatch is the unintentional catch of organisms um, and typically turtles, sharks, dolphins, other fish that are not part of the fishery, uh, seals and whales, all in, are all included within bycatch. And um, if you were a commercial fisherman here in Hawaii, you have to declare what your fishery is before you go out to fish. So for instance, if I was a commercial fisherman, I would have to tell the state of Hawaii I'm going to go out and catch skip, skipjack tuna. Okay, if I go out and I collect a yellowfin tuna, I will get fined for that because that is not part of the fishery that I'm going out for. So that would be the category of other fish. Or in that image right there, if I caught that leatherback turtle and I brought it back ashore, I would get fined for that because I was not supposed to be catching leatherback turtles which, by the way, are endangered. <laughs> so you shouldn't be catching turtles in the first place. And then secondly, ghost fishing uh, is another huge and rampant problem because uh, this is a fish that are caught by abandoned gear. So a gear, uh, fishing nets and, and lines that were left behind because either the fishermen couldn't find them or they were broken, so they just threw them overboard. Um, lots of stuff happen uh, and so because of that these these nets they just float around the ocean continuously catching fish and nobody catch and nobody takes advantage of those resources so those fisheries are still getting caught but nobody's taking advantage of it and that's a huge problem especially with the marine pollution that we're experiencing right now all right so now let's talk about um, fisheries management Okay, and this uh, is, you need to be able to calculate your maximum sustainable yield in a fishery in order to consider whether you are managing your fishery or not. And in order to calculate maximum sustainable yield, you need to know the following information. You need to know the stock, the number of individuals within this fishery. And you need to know how quickly these organisms grow and how quickly they reproduce. You need to know how long they live for and you need to know what they eat. Okay, out of all four of those, I think the hardest one to figure out is how many individuals are in that population. 
because if this um, species is migratory, like your tuna, how do you keep track of all of them that are swimming around, right? And then also, too, how do you keep track of a school of, of um, anchovies, right? They Even though they do group together, and it could be easy to calculate all of them, how would you do that? I mean, there's probably thousands of them, uh, right? So... Uh, while the actual population size is uh, the unknown factor here, because you can always test to see how quickly these organisms grow or how fast they reproduce or how long they live and what they eat, um, really knowing how many individuals there are is um, the hard part to figure out. But you can make an estimate determined uh, by determining how many fish get caught and are brought back. So that the catch, the uh, amount of catch uh, is used in that in that case right there. Okay, so when we look at marine protected areas, um, these are areas that fishing is banned and is uh, strictly managed. And so here in Hawaii, we have the uh, Papa Hana Mokuakea uh, Marine National Monument. Um, and this is the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And this entire area is a protected area. So nobody can go in there to fish. Um, and these uh, protected areas generally have high uh, biomass and high biodiversity because nobody fishes over there. Or at least they're not supposed to, right? Uh, but we'll talk about uh, why that is because so this is uh, the northwestern Hawaiian Islands they span uh, let's see four degrees of latitude okay so how do you enforce no fishing within these four degrees of latitude so we have what's called exclusive economic zones or EEZs all right these are jurisdictions off of the coastlines of country and on this map here you can see all of the EEZs that are under the U.S.'s control right you can see Alaska has a giant EEZ um, but EEZs are only three miles off of the coastline so having an island extends your EEZ all right so in Alaska you can see the Aleutian Islands extends downward so in that sense, it extends Alaska's EEZ by three miles off of the nearest coastline. So if you guys have heard of China creating their own island in the middle of the uh, Western Pacific, and that's the reason why they did that is because they wanted to expand their EEZ, right? Can't say I would recommend that, um, but they tried. I'm not quite sure if it's legal, <laughs> But again, <laughs> they tried. And so you can see all the purple regions. That's where Hawaii, Hawaii is in a purple region. So that's our three mile economic zone. You can see the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are included in our economic zone because it is part of the national monument. And so again, I, I ask you, how do you, how do you police uh, those, these EEZs? Uh, you know, what, what is, uh, What's to say a Chinese fisherman comes to Hawaii or say goes to Alaska and wants to fish within our EEZ? How do how do we prevent that? Right? You can't we can't have a police a police boat running around the northwestern Hawaiian Islands all the time. That would be really costly. Right? And then also look at all of the light blue area that's outside of the US's EEZ zone, right? So who patrols that? Who controls all of that, right? Which country controls the middle of the Pacific? Okay, so I'll leave those questions to you. You can figure out those answers. Um, but sustainable fish, there's a, a there's a thing called the a Sustainable Fisheries Act. The U.S. signed this act, um, but it was not ratified by the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, but essentially what this act states is that uh, 
we need to develop a management plan to prevent overfishing the and restore depleted stocks and reduce bycatch. So those are the three main goals of this Sustainable Fisheries Act. Um, it's too bad it didn't get ratified. Uh, but if that were the case, then that means all, all the countries who signed this act would have to implement this. Uh, but even though the UN did not ratify it, the US is still making strides in trying to prevent overfishing, reducing bycatch, and trying to restore depleted stocks. So for instance, um, Hawaii is trying to replenish depleted stocks by uh, creating uh, aquaculture facilities. And so off of the coast of the Big Island, um, there's a huge effort to try to uh, replenish uh, moi. I think it's moi. And I forget what the other fish is, but they have these giant pens that sit off of the coast of Kona on the Big Island. And they, these giant nets house uh, tons of fish that are meant to be sold um, back into the market uh, to relieve fishing pressures on the wild. And then, um, and this can also be used for depleted stocks. So you can also try to farm raise de any depleted stock species and try to release them into the wild uh, to try to uh, increase the fishery. But with this being said, it's really hard if you don't know what, what the original population was. So with that being said, um, if you try to find new fisheries that are possibly new or underexploited uh, to market instead of those overexploited ones, maybe you can help those overexploited ones uh, get back to a more sustainable population. So I ask you, would you, uh, instead of picking up that nice fillet of ahi for dinner, would you pick up a fillet of turtle, perhaps? Would you try that? I, I, I've been told it's pretty good. Or what about instead of those nice plump shrimp that you like to eat, how about uh, taking a bite in some in some krill? Hmm? Would you, you guys, would you guys think of that as being uh, tasty? Or what about jellyfish? Would you guys eat jellyfish? I have. I've tried it. It's not so bad. You can go to any of the dim sum restaurants in Chinatown, order up a plate of jellyfish, and um, have a sample of it. I wouldn't say I would eat it all the time, but if I had to, I would eat it. Um, so... That being said, it's really hard to find these new or underexploited uh, fisheries because of very picky eaters, <laughs> like most Americans are, um, or it's just you don't know how to uh, market them. Because really, look at that fish on the top right-hand corner there. Would you eat that fish? Isn't that the most appetizing fish you could think of? Um, I believe that's the fish that they use, um, the Inuit. Uh, population buries it into the soil and ferments it and when it comes out it's stinky um, so yeah anyways that or you can try aquaculture uh, aquaculture is being done right now and it has been done for uh, centuries Chinese have raised freshwater species using aquaculture uh, Romans raised oysters and the Hawaiians yeah, the Hawaiians created fish ponds. Yeah, he's telling you all about the fish ponds. Um, and uh, aquaculture was, was meant to assist in meeting the market demand for certain species. Right? And it does do that right now. So the only thing with the only thing with aquaculture is that it can cause environmental issues, right? So aquaculture can create uh, eutrophication, which could introduce uh, nutrients into the environment. Um, you can also release genetically modified individuals into the wild, which could or could not be bad, depending on how you feel about GMOs um, and a whole slew of other um, problems. Okay, so in this image right here, this is one potential problem of aquaculture. So this is fish pens that they have near the coastal ocean. Um, and they it, it's feeding time for these fish. But as you can see, 
you you see the guy in yellow throwing fish into into the fish pond but then you see the guy in gray with the red hat and he's holding a hose why do you think he's holding a hose for why i mean he's in the ocean why would he need water for right but he's hosing all of those birds trying to prevent them from catching the fish that's supposed to go and be the meal for their fish okay so this is a potential problem because now you're changing um, the wild habitat of, of those birds. So you're changing their behavior. So it's, instead of them going out and catching their own food, um, they are relying on this fishery to feed them. So th this fishery, like clockwork, will come out at the same time every day to feed their fish. So if you knew that there was a stable food source that came out on a regular basis at the same time every day wouldn't you use that food source instead of going out and spending the time to hunt for yourself well don't blame the birds then because <laughs> we're just making it easier for them so that's a potential problem as well as this image right here this image you can see all of the fish pens are close together um, and what do you think is problem in this image right here you know, is there a problem with the fish, the fish pens right here? You don't see any massive swarmings of birds in this image. But what you don't see in this image is the amount of fish poop that is being generated by all of the fish that live within these fish pens. And because they are so close together, they are concentrating their fish poop right below the pens. So because you're concentrating all of those nutrients in one area, you're eventually going to cause an overgrowth of algae within this area. Okay. Especially if that's near a coastal region. So here in this uh, graphic right here, you can see the potential uh, uh, drawbacks to open water aquaculture. Okay. You can see invasive species can get into the nets and take over. You can see, um, uh, uh, how do you say, not drugs, um, antibiotics that they use in the feed can actually get into uh, the ocean and get into the water environment and actually create an imbalance in the um, bacteria that you find there. Um, nets can get damaged, so individuals can escape and mix with the wild population. You can also have new diseases and parasites forming because you have individuals living so close to each other that um, maybe the, their their habitat isn't clean enough because they're pooping a lot, right? And that will cause uh, new diseases to pop up um, that can affect all the individuals within the net. And then um, here, this is an image of a more sustainable uh, aquaculture um, uh, set up, right? So you have your fish pen, you have your nets with your fish in them, right? Um, but next to the fish pens, you have uh, algae. And these algae uh, will then pick up all of the nutrients from the fish poop so that it doesn't um, become an issue. And then you can also harvest the algae as well as the fish. And then next to the algae, you'll have a string of mussels or oysters. And in this case, then, that helps get rid of all of the suspended material. So any of those fish poop that doesn't get processed or any of the dead material that comes off of the fish or the algae will be collected by the mussels and the oysters. And in that case, then, you have a, a much smaller uh, environmental impact than if you didn't have all three of these. All right, so you can also have aquaculture on land. And here in Hawaii, we have a number of aquaculture facilities on land. Um, but again, uh, there are some drawbacks to this one. You do need a lot of seawater. So you do need to be near the coastal region. And that water needs to go somewhere. So it usually goes back into the ocean. So a lot of those concerns that you had with the open water nets are also a concern with uh, pop, uh fisheries uh, aquaculture that is on land. You can have another type of uh, fishery that's known as ranching. 
Uh, so in Alaska, primarily they do what's known as salmon ranching. And this is where they raise uh, small f salmon fish and then release them into the wild. So in this case, it helps replenish the wild stocks. So you can see in these two images right here, um, these are the pens in which they keep the small, what they call small fry um, or the small fishes. And then once they get to a certain size, then they will release them back into the stream and they can join uh, their adult counterparts. So uh, some natural products, aside from food that you can get from the ocean, you can get wood and charcoal from mangroves. You can get pearls, shells, corals, leather from sharks, relaxation, whale, walks, whale watching, and um, aquarium trade. So you can actually get um, aquarium fishes from the wild. Um, so yeah, all of these things can be found in the ocean. Some non-living resources that you can find is energy. So you can get uh, energy from wind water and you can get thermal energy as well too you can get fresh water um, if you desalinate the water the salt water and you can also get minerals so you can get your salt from the ocean water as well too so here are just some images of a desalination process on the top image there the bottom image is that um, of buoys that uh, have uh, that either uh, go up and down or wiggle in a sense with uh, the ocean surface and they generate waves that way. Uh, this particular one um, brings in ocean water uh, from the surface and then it brings in water from the deep and the difference in the temperature between the surface water and the deep water um, causes the turbines to move and thereby creates energy. So that's just one way of uh, doing uh, thermal energy in the ocean. Uh, another way is these windmills uh, out in the open ocean. Uh, certain areas in the open ocean have um, high winds and so these windmills can then capture that wind and, um, and collect the energy from that. And then also, too, you can actually farm uh, salt, right? And so these are mounds of salt that can be evaporated from the water and left behind um, and then collected. And this is what where your table salt comes from. So pretty interesting, huh? Okay, so that is chapter 17, so stay tuned for chapter 18, which will be the last chapter uh, that we'll cover this semester, and I will upload those next week, Monday. So, enjoy your Thanksgiving weekend.